Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this um, theological education um, in the Anglican Communion and the Cambridge Center for Christianity Worldwide uh, seminar on South Asia uh, challenges and opportunities for theological education. So, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening, uh, and wherever you know, from wherever you you join. So, thank you very much uh, for being with us today. And I'm uh, Muthuraj Swami. Um, I work as the uh, project manager for theological education for mission in the Anglican Communion, as well as I direct uh, uh, the Cambridge Center for Christianity Worldwide. And we have with us today, uh, Reverend Canon Dr. Stephen Spencer, uh, director for theological education in the Anglican Communion, uh, who will in a moment uh, uh, speak to you and welcome um, you all, and also will do the opening prayer. Uh, but before that, uh, a few things. Um, we have also um, Mr. Oscar Sayo, uh, who is one of our research associates, uh, who is helping us with uh, Zoom technology and welcome Oscar. Um, and also we have three speakers. Uh, today's three speakers are uh, Reverend Professor Israel David from India and Ms. Lubna Yunas Devan uh, from Pakistan and Reverend Rasiga Abbasinghe. Uh, from Sri Lanka and welcome to you all. And a couple of housekeeping things, uh, as I said earlier, please um, uh, uh, stay, uh, keep your button um, on your Zoom um, muted when you um, are not speaking. And then when uh, the time comes, when you want to ask a question uh, or want to share a comment, uh, please unmute and, and speak. And this um, um, session is recorded. And, and this will be later available uh, on our YouTube channel uh, of, as many people who are unable to join, join us this morning have um, asked for the video. So we are very happy to um, uh, upload the video. But in case uh, you don't want to be seen, uh, you are very welcome to uh, um, turn off your video, but uh, please be aware that the uh, video, uh, I mean, the session is recorded. And um, as we are, um, you know, a large group, there's um, there are uh, there's you know not not enough time for um, introducing each other. So what I do, um, what I suggest is that if you could uh, in the chat box, if you could write your name, and your position and your affiliation uh, to a theological institution uh, or or church, and if you could mention that um, uh, in the chat box as well as your country. So if you could um, uh, write that in your chat box, uh, it will be very helpful and, and you are very welcome to do that. Uh, your name, your position, um, your uh, institution or church name, oh, and, and, and um, also your country. And the format for today's program will be um, like this. So we will begin with um, um, Dr. Israel David uh, um, making a presentation of 15 minutes followed by a 10 minutes initial uh, clarifications and questions time, then followed by uh, Ms. Um, Lubna Yunas presenting for 15 minutes, followed by 10 minutes um, uh, initial clarifications. And then we will have a five minutes break. Um, when we still stay on Zoom, we'll just you know have a five minutes break, then we'll come back. And then uh, Reverend Rasika Basinge will make 15 minutes presentation followed by 10 minutes initial clarifications. And then at the end, we will have about 30 minutes for uh, the comments and questions as, a, uh, as we all together. And um, yeah, so that's all uh, from me. And now I hand over to uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Spencer, the Director for Theological Education in the Anglican Communion. Uh, hello everyone, welcome. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, thank you so much for joining this uh, this webinar. Uh, this is the uh, first in the series that we're, that we're running this year for theological education in the Ang Anglican Communion. So as you know today the focus is South Asia. Uh, the second webinar in May will be looking at uh, Latin America and the Caribbean region and then we are planning a third webinar in later in the year looking at, uh, at Africa. So thank you for joining us and uh, 
this is very exciting to be connected with so many different places in in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and indeed other countries around the world. It is so exciting to see you all this morning. We will have um, a photo uh, later before the break, uh, so so we'll please be ready for that. We'll we'll tell you about that when we get there. So. Um, my role is just to welcome you and also to do an opening prayer uh, and, uh, and to get us on our way this morning. Before I do that, I really want to say thank you and pay tribute to my colleague Mutharaj Swami for pulling this together and making it happen. So thank you so much for that. So let me say an opening prayer. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God of earth and heaven, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Guide and equip the churches and colleges and seminaries and programs of the Anglican Communion and of the wider church. As they proclaim the good news of your kingdom, in faith and life and so reveal the truth of your loving presence a truth that sets us free through your son and in your spirit today tomorrow and in years to come amen thank you thank you thank you very much stephen um, um, for your um, wonderful words of uh, welcome as well as uh, the prayer. And we'll now straight away uh, move into our uh, session. So we'll begin with um, um, a, presentation, a presentation by uh, Professor uh, Israel David. Um, now Dr. Israel David is professor at the United Theological College, Bangalore, India, and chairperson uh, of um, the Christian Ministry Department there. He is ordained minister from the Church of South India, uh, Royal Sima Diocese, Andhra Pradesh. And formerly he was principal of the Calvin Theological Institute in India. And, and the faculty dean at the Union Biblical Seminary um, in Pune. Uh, he is widely published in his field and we are very um, glad to have you, uh, Dr. Israel, with us today. And now the, the next 15 minutes uh, is for you. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and also maybe good night. I thank God uh, for this privilege. And I thank Dr. Uh, Stephen Spencer for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity. And I'm grateful to Dr. Mutraj for inviting me and for the kind uh, words of introduction. The title of my presentation is Challenges and Opportunities for Theological Education in India, Insights from COVID-19 Pandemic. I have tried my best to locate theological education in India in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. My paper uh, or in fact presentation has four major parts, namely pandemic, lesson for theological education, second perspectives of divinity, humanity and faith community related to COVID-19 and third purpose of theological education and fourth priorities and probabilities. Due to availability of time, that means 15 minutes, I will read the first two parts and the third and fourth I will explain in a few uh, words. COVID-19 pandemic has impacted and influenced every aspect of human life. Education in general and theological education in particular have not escaped from the onslaught of COVID-19. The current presentation attempts to highlight a few challenges that the Indian theological education has experienced in the last two years. It means from March 2020 till now. The pandemic is not yet over. Since these concerns emerge from my personal reflections of my personal experiences, they are very much subjective in nature. Hence, I do not generalize my findings and I am afraid to claim representing the Indian theological education 
but reflect as an Indian theological educator. The paper aims to present the challenges that emerged from the pandemic and the impact of these challenges on perspectives in theology and attempts to revisit the purpose of theological education in India by suggesting a few priorities and probabilities. Pandemic lessons for theological education. Theological education has encountered many challenges in the past, but continues to survive, contribute, and align. The COVID-19 pandemic has been one such challenge that has brought many insights to theological education to continue its ministry in India. The following are the few significant experiences of theological education during COVID-19 pandemic. I have 10. Number one, understanding crisis. When the announcement of first lockdown reached the campuses of theological colleges in March 2020, most of them were caught unaware to respond to the crisis. The unpreparedness of colleges has exposed the very understanding of crisis. The crisis counseling classes have not adequately prepared both the students and the educators to respond to their own emotional ill health and the society in which they are located. The panic, fear, and anxiety rose to an alarming level as few seminaries and colleges asked the students and others to leave the campus as they found inadequate resources to provide care for them. A few colleges had decided to call off the classes well before the lockdown was announced. There were a few colleges that quickly comprehended the situations and worked out care and support patterns to the COVID-19 positive students and community members. However, others even now do not have caring patterns and protocols at hand, leaving students to care for themselves, resulting in anxiety among the parents. The new saying, negative is positive, seems to have brought a lot of relief to the leaders of the seminaries and colleges. The need of campus healthcare system is felt by everyone. The certainty of uncertainty seems to be challenging the decision-making abilities of theological colleges. There is a great need to train, equip, and prepare the theological community to comprehend human crisis and to respond to the same in a healthy manner. The pandemic crisis is both personal and social in dimension. Two, the method of learning. The COVID-19 has created space for new alternative ways and methods of learning in theological education. The educators, those who were averse to online mode of learning, were forced to switch, switch over to online mode. However, the limited technical resources and the knowledge have not helped the students and the educators. The attempt to transfer the in-person learning curriculum to the online mode has put a lot of stress on the theological community. The digital divide was visible among them and the Indian rural theological students have undergone even now are undergoing depression, emerging due to poor internet connection and non-availability of gadgets. There are incidences of students dropping out on the account of inability to have access to proper technological infrastructure. Further, it is argued that the family physical spaces have been rocked by the online classes as there were, there were restrictions of movement in homes during online classes. The privacy of family members has been hit. Third, the method of assessment. The Indian theological fraternity struggled to develop a pattern of examination as the classes were conducted online and the examinations were to be conducted virtually. It is a new experience for the educators. Though many colleges have adopted the open book examination patterns, the learners found it difficult to comply with them. Moreover, attempting to evaluate the knowledge, skill, and critical faculty of the learners from the OPE, OBE pattern based on the old pattern of question papers did not go well with both the students and the educators. However, the new normal has forced to think theological education in India to chart out new creative ways of assessing. I personally consider that the COVID-19 pandemic has created an opportunity to revisit the very assessment of learning in India. Fourth, the field education, the praxis. Another challenge that the theological education encountered during pandemic is difficulty in equipping the ministers of God in ministerial practices. Theological education is praxis oriented and COVID-19 has dendered this aspect of learning to a greater extent. The experiences of people are the main source of theologizing. Since a majority of the students will be completing their education without grassroots level experiences, there is a danger of limiting theologizing itself. The church services went online, thus creating new opportunities for the trainers and trainees to be relevant to the spiritual needs of the congregations and the society. There was a lot of excitement among the theological community as many of them appeared on social media to preach the gospel for the first time. 
further certain theological subjects such as pastoral counseling and mission have always set apart a greater portion of their syllabus for clinical exposure that has been denied by covid-19 pandemic living and expressing faith in times of crisis has become a great challenge fifth the community experience one of the major impacts of covid-19 on the theological education in india is the absence of community life experiences it is believed that the indian mind is community oriented and theological colleges campuses provide greater opportunity not only a sense of belongingness but to be sensitive to the ethos of various cultures and church traditions india being a pluralistic society in terms of religion culture language and faith it is unimaginable that a theological student gets a degree without encountering people of other cultures the online community has become the new normal and online behavior has become a new pattern in behaviorist psychology a meaningful human community is a precondition for living theology and a test for authentic theology but it is heartening to notice bats finding their spaces on the campuses due to limited or no movement of people thus resettling ecosystem was happening fifth or sixth the formation dimension the true essence of theological education also lies in the sincerity in ministry of formation namely theological ministerial academic personality and spiritual formations there are several methods and patterns followed by theological colleges to realize these formations the ministry of formation happens both in personal and collective levels and it reflects the educator learner relationship uh, too the covid 19 pandemic has heavily affected these aspects of theological education and colleges continue to struggle to invent new and alternative ways of ministry of formation seven the academic resources most of the indian students depend on hard copies of library resources and covid 19 pandemic has reduced their accessibility to libraries both the educators and the students are forced to depend on the online sources which is a new territory for many students though it is not a concern for a small group of tech savvy students the unauthentic resources from online sources have occupied most of the space in research work which has not enhanced the quality of academic work however the inability to collect data in person has inspired the researchers to switch over to social media centered methods of data collection the economic impact the eighth one the economic impact of pandemic is felt both by the faculty members of the theological colleges in india by the students there are incidences of either no pay or reduced pay for the faculty the sudden loss of employment and non availability of jobs has brought a lot of stress to the parents who were seeking cons concession in fee the lack of inflow of funds to the sponsoring bodies have added to the crisis however the pandemic has brought to the light the willingness of the faculty members and their family members to accept the realities and to respond to the situation accordingly nine the emotional impact the emotional impact has two dimensions that emerge from the unknown nature of covid-19 and the inability to cope with the new educational conditions many students have tested positive for covid-19 and they experienced fear anxiety and loneliness especially the death of a parent priest theological educators friends and relatives have put the theological community in india under tremendous stress the experience in isolation ward of hospitals added to their depression in the midst of personal loss and anxiety moving to a new area of learning via online has emotionally strained many however these are attempts there are attempts by a few theological colleges who prepared certain protocols to respond to the emerging situation so that the impact could be limited the 10th and the final one social distance it is unfortunate to note that the theological colleges had concentrated on the self care campus care and christian care during the pandemic a kind of insensitivity to the needs of the society was obvious though a few seminaries distributed essentials to the community members they were charity in nature not being a neighbor to the suffering many faith communities other than christianity opened their worship places and institutions for the migrant workers to stay distributed food to them and even engaged in burial of bodies some of the buildings were converted as isolation wards but i am not aware any seminary building was used as an isolation ward though few church buildings were used probably we understood social distancing differently the aforementioned mentioned issues and concerns have tremendously affected the theology in india they that is uh, that uh, leads me to the second part 
perspectives divinity humanity faith community at least three theological per perspectives were the topics in the classroom and other conversations among the theological fraternity among pandemic uh, during pandemic they are perspectives of god humanity and faith community the covid 19 pandemic has created a lot of space for the theological community to discuss these themes one perspective of god the theo in theological education has been one of the major theological themes among learners the gender of god the nature of god and the actions of god have different meanings in various theological circles in other words it is interesting to know that god is not understood in the same way in all the theological classrooms the major theological discourses on god during pandemic is related to god as a punisher or the mystery of god or the protecting and sustaining nature of god or an angry god etc naming and renaming of god to understand the nature of god and the identity of selfhood in particular context is an ongoing process the father the mother and the parent nature of god has been questioned and debated without finding an adequate response the punishment for sin of humanity by god was another theme that dominated the conversation along with god as liberator god as wounded healer and a vulnerable god the second one the perspectives of humanity though hum, uh, human limitations are discussed widely in theology the pandemic has brought humanity to the realization that its scientific knowledge is limited and question and the question is how far we can trust science which is a product of human knowledge the major exposed by the pandemic is however how in india the margins like the dalits tribals women continue to be vulnerable in times of crisis the pandemic has affirmed that theological education that deliberately avoids the experiences of these people is irrelevant in indian context unfortunately most of the webinars and seminars organized by the church and other christian institutions have discussed the problems of work from home rather than those who work far home as i call the migrant workers a people centered paradigm of theological education is essential the third perspective the final perspective the perspectives of faith community the ministry of theological education is a ministry by the church of the church and for the mission of god i believe that the church should own the theological education and the pandemic has only affirmed this belief i strongly believe any attempt either by the church to quarantine theological education or any attempt by theological education to go for self isolation will not serve the purpose of the theological education neither the church nor the theological education can can hand wash their responsibility to fulfill the purpose of theological education further both cannot try to lock down each other within their boundaries though the current paper does not attempt to sanitize the relationship between church and theological education it aims to find out significant variants of the purpose of theological education to understand the challenges and opportunities in indian subcontinent in fulfilling uh, that purpose the relationship between the church and the theological seminaries gains its significance as the faith communities mission of building holistic community now very briefly next few minutes about the purpose i believe the purpose of theological education in the lessons from uh, lessons learned from covid 19 is humanization a process of becoming liberated i believe that theological education is a liberative tool in the mission of god thus emphasizing the ministry of liberation a survey of trends in the development of theological education in india by samuel amirdam a pioneer in indian theological education further points towards this purpose i have the history in my paper maybe we can read afterwards if ministry of liberation is the major focus of theological education its essence according to howard kleinbell is the freedom to become all that one has the possibilities of becoming borrowing mm thomas thought of humanization i propose that the purpose of indian theological education should be a process of humanization the becoming for me is becoming a full human which has been denied to the majority of the indians who are kept in the margins in many aspects can social justice social healing and human rights to be the focus in this process of humanization provided by theological education the ministry of the church as a response to the experiences of the people of god has to sincerely admit there are three aspects of liberation namely far from to 
It is liberation from those forces that attempt to block the freedom of becoming a better human, liberation to abundant life, and liberation for life in the spirit, which is both personal and so, uh, so societal. Humanization will empower the people to search and respond to the fundamental issues in India. The final few lines, priorities and probabilities, I conclude with hope. The lessons from COVID-19 pandemic have taught that theological education in India can move forward with purpose of becoming or humanizing as a process. The theological education should become uh, to be sensitive to the challenges and to the context. Theological education should view crises from the human rights and human dignity point of view. Hum uh, the humanization based on social justice, social healing and social harmony should gu guide and direct uh, the theological education and uh, to be part of nation building with equality and dignity and uh, to be aware that theological education as a channel and tool in the mission of God in realizing fullness of human life to be sensitive to the ecumenical nature of church and the theological education finally to create adequate financial resources as a long-term solution to support the rural poor and marginalized and to become not a rational community alone, but to be sensitive to the emotional aspects of the community members and to be aware of changing perspectives on God and humanity and ministry. Let me say this and conclude. Theological education as critical engagement shall be the channel of liberation of becoming what every individual and community can become to experience the fullness of humanness. Theological education has the commitment to build up the church and to transform the society. For this to happen, we need to accept that the challenges will lead to changes and making theological, theological education as the channel of hope to the humanity, which is a priority and it has all the possibilities. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Israel David, uh, for your very enriching um, uh, reflection um, and presentation about the um, theological education in the Indian context, particularly uh, within the uh, context of the pandemic. Um, now, next few minutes um, is actually time for any initial uh, clarifications or questions. Very briefly, um, we got about maybe five minutes uh, for initial clarifications we can take from um, maybe one or two people. Um, there will be time for longer comments later, and you are very welcome to uh, post your comments on the chat box, uh, short or long comments. But when you speak, you are requested to speak um, you know, very shortly, given that you know, we have um, um, a lot of um, participants are here. So um, maybe we'll take two or three initial questions or clarifications if you want to have. As I cannot see the whole screen, if you could you know, use your uh, digital hand, it will be really good. Okay, here is a question. Um, has the move to online learning uh, reached some people who were previously unreached? So there's a question. Um, has the move to online learning reached some people who were previously unreached? So Dr. Israel, would you like to respond to that? The answer uh, that comes to my mind uh, at present is both yes and no. Because we are discussing about uh, theological education. And uh, definitely as uh, from my experience, the uh, rural parts and the, uh, I, I would call uh, the interior parts of India, the theological education uh, definitely uh, is making inroads because of the online. But however, that has also exposed the uh, very, the, the, the poor, uh, uh, infrastructures, technological infrastructures that we have. So in the context of uh, theological education, I would rather say 
mostly no uh, very unfortunate very unfortunate because i have several students uh, dropping out uh, from uh, the 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 uh, theological education due to non availability or very poor internet some have relocated yeah, them yeah. from uh, their own uh, uh, homes to some unknown strange you no know, strange places uh, to have and that has affected them uh for the people to use uh, uh the uh, social media uh, to take this uh, uh, gospel to the people in that sense yes yeah um thank you dr israel and maybe we will take one more um question or comment now and there will be of course um, as i said there will be time for more questions later um i don't see any hands um, at the moment so um yeah once again um thank you uh, dr israel we will come back to you um, with with more comments and questions and and thank you very much once again for your wonderful presentation uh, with that now we move to the uh, second presentation uh, by um miss um, uh, lubna yunas um and uh, ms lubna yunas devan uh, is the principal of st thomas theological college uh, in karachi in pakistan uh, the college is the national seminary of the church of pakistan and it is an ecumenical uh, college serving uh, several denominations um she is already involved uh, with the theological education the anglican communion um, in helping with producing uh, some theological education resources and we are very happy to have um, you um, lubna uh, with us um, this morning and thanks for joining us and the next 15 minutes uh, is yours Thank you so much, Mr. Um, Raj. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, to Dr. Estrella. So motivated, and uh, yeah, you gave me a kind of really tough challenge. You are such a professional, and I hope I will uh, uh, kind of um, present uh, the stuff uh, I want to. Um, I will not really focus on pandemic, but uh, overall challenges in Pakistan that uh, theological education is facing. So, as Mr. Uh, Raj said, that. Um, yeah we are ecumenical uh, kind of church and plus seminary but i want to say that we are united church church of pakistan is a united church and we are united with methodist lutheran and scottish presbyterian but in practices we are mainly anglican and st thomas's seminary is uh, the only seminary of this uh, church of pakistan and uh, yeah we are here from more than 40 years so such a blessing for us and um, I want to say that Pakistan is Islamic Republic of Pakistan. So it is very, very dis distinguished by name. And uh, minorities are only 2% in Pakistan. So Christians are less than 1% here. So there are many strengths and challenges for us in Pakistan to be in a theological uh, institute. And uh, few I will uh, discuss is that, uh, of course, a lack of sufficient resources qualified and competent faculty, research and development, and place of women in theological education and contextualization. So first of all, I want to discuss uh, the strength of our resources, which is definitely will start from our library. So as we know that library is a very, very major factor and major place for an, kind of any theological education and any institution as well. So the main challenge of Pakistani library of theological uh, institute is this, that we have really lack of uh, financial resources. The thing I want to say that most of the time, we just uh, welcome resources that we receive from our friends, and these are gifted resources. 
So sometimes we don't have really choice that, uh, yeah, we can choose what we want, but sometimes things are really sent to us and we receive it. And uh, because of sometimes really heavy duties, uh, it's difficult for us to take that books as well. So this is one of the struggle that library resources are very limited and uh, our funding for library in the seminary is very low. Other what I can say that sometimes it's nothing because we need to uh, just struggle with our internal funding and other resources. So library is the main place, which is very, very neglected in the Institute. So as uh, uh, Professor Israel was talking about pandemic, so last year we saw very tough time because of pandemic, because our library and students were not really ready uh, to face the challenge of pandemic as well, because we needed to have online resources uh, for the library. And uh, we don't have such a uh, connection with international libraries because they need huge fee, which currently we are not able to pay for connections and to have that kind of resources. Other, our IT department is very weak. We don't have sufficient computer, even laptops in the seminary. I just want to say the background of our community in Pakistan. So uh, our Indian brothers and sisters and other those who are interested in South Asia, they know uh, Dalit community, which is untouchable. What I want to say that Pakistani church, most of conversion happened in the British era, it was from Dalit. So 95% of Pakistani church community is Punjabi church, which is converted from that group. So indeed, Pakistani church is a struggling church. And what I want to say that 80% of our congregation is in a low paid job, which affects church plus theological institutes as well. So yeah, the situation of library is this, that we don't have really trained librarians as well. So in in this kind of uh, situation, when we don't have proper resources, library, so uh, institutes suffer a lot. Then qualified and competent faculty. The challenge of our faculty is this, that especially those who are older one, uh, my Indian brothers and sisters, they can understand this term very well, guru and chela. They that is like that uh, teachers need to teach everything and students need to listen. So some of our teachers, they are following really, really old pattern and students, they just need to follow it. So there's such a need in this time that, uh, yeah, teachers need to update themselves and uh, need to update their books as well and need to update their curriculum as. So yeah, we are facing this uh, issue as well that very, very old matters still going on in Pakistan. Second main issue is this, yeah, uh, salaries, of teachers are very, very low. That's what we can say that third grade salary is in the institution of theological um, institution in Pakistan in seminary. What I can say if uh, we will convert it in um, Great Britain pound, so it is less than 200 pounds for each teacher. And that creates social economical problem for us that most of our competent people, they leave country for better jobs. And usually uh, those who go abroad for further study, they don't want to come back. Even they switch their jobs. They can go for minor jobs rather than to be a, a theologian, a pastor or any other church related job. But just for that economic problem they are facing in Pakistan, uh, they can switch uh, their profession and then they can work in every, any kind of capacity in, in the first world countries. So most of uh, our kind of big names in Pakistan, they are already migrated from Pakistan. If you see history of Pakistan, so you will find 1947, there were 23% of minority. And now it became less to just 2% and Christian are below 1%. So this is a huge gap of migration from uh, that uh, Christian of Pakistan and up to know that uh, many people, they are migrated. The main thing I want to share is this that, uh, in Pakistan, we don't have really research degrees offered by our institutes. We just have MDiv and BTS degrees and somehow diploma and certificates programs. But other needs like uh, masters in education, masters in Christian counseling, masters of theology, and we don't have any program which is offering uh, are leading to PhD. So this is such a gap for us. 
that uh, making a really problem for us that how uh, in future we have more theologians and more teacher. And um, if we see that uh, theological education doctor and biblical scholars in Pakistan, we can just count on fingers. Uh, we don't have a New Testament uh, PhD in Pakistan. We don't have systematic theology PhD in Pakistan. Many other areas is missing in Pakistan. So actually the education within Pakistan is going it's not really that uh, we can build uh, more scholars and scholarships are not available for us for further study as well. So this is a challenge for us. The main thing I want to discuss is here is a uh, woman in theology. Pakistan is a Muslim majority country as I mentioned before. So majority is uh, kind of leaving its impact on um, minority as well. So we can see that Pakistani church is a many Muslim uh, kind of mindset community. So freedom for women is very, very limited here. Anglican community and other communities, they really don't allow women for ordination. So there's no woman ordination and you will not really see women on a really proper places and leadership places. If a Senate meeting is going on, if a kind of, uh, clergy meeting is going on. So of course, clergy, in, clergy women are not there. So this is such a gap and a lack of opportunity in the church for women. So most of our female students, when they come to seminary, so the main question is this, what they are going to do after their theological education, because their church and even their parents and um, a close one, they ask what you are going to do after completion of uh, the study. And this is a challenge. And I know that some of our really, really brilliant students after completion of that study, they are just Sunday school teacher as a volunteer and some of Christian schools, they want to have them uh, for uh, theological education uh, kind of, which is running in the school, but not really on the uh, large level or uh, what I want to say that big level leadership positions are vacant, but really they don't want to give a chance to a woman to be there. So place in a place of the woman in theological education is really challenging for Pakistan. And women, uh, when they come to Pakistan, uh, especially in our seminary, they need to go for a uh, Master of Divinity and uh, Bachelor of Theology program, which is, which is totally designed for uh, ordination and for ministerial work. Uh, so always uh, our question is this, what these females are going with these degrees? just is their interest and that just they want to learn it. But after that, the challenge for them that how they are going to utilize this. And other challenge for us is this, that context. As I said, that our main challenge is context because we are under uh, Islamic um, influence. So our teacher, most of them, they are trained for, from the West and the books we have is from the West but how we can relate it with Pakistan, the challenge of Pakistan. So we don't have such scholars who can relate these things to Pakistan. So this kind of um, making a really thing that the scholar who is uh, graduated from West, how they are going to apply this thing in this context. It's a challenging for us. But the good thing I see, yeah, Pakistani scholar, most of the time uh, our leaders say that uh, a Pakistani Christian is half Muslim as well. So when a person is from Pakistan, they have such a good understanding of Islam as well, because they pushed us to study from our childhood up to our graduation level, Quran is mandatory. So we know really the basic of uh, Islamization and their teaching as well. So from Pakistan, strong theology can be developed that how, a minority can live in Pakistan and what is the really viewpoint of Islamic uh, theology and how we can uh, uh, move according to context. So during this time, what we have seen that opportunity which is developed. Many opportunities, uh, what I can say that when eight years back, I came to the seminary, so only one female student was here. And I was the first female teacher 
in St. Thomas Theological Seminary. It was such a challenge that what she is going to do it. But after 10 years and after that eight years, especially years I served somewhere else, we can see that now we have 50 times females in our institute. And recently, Uh, I think it's okay. Yes. Uh, so I want to say that um, such a uh, good thing is this, that um, this is the first time in the history that they have appointed a female president. So I hope that uh, more opportunities will be there. And uh, I have more colleagues as a female uh, teacher now. Uh, Ms. Sana Shiraz is also there and uh, our language teacher is... Uh, uh, female, so opportunities are opening, and uh, Pakistani church is admitting yes, a woman can do something. And uh, other thing positive I can see is this that due to pandemic, uh, Zoom classes and other opportunities are open. So we are having more international teachers. So Anglican community they really helped us. Uh, one of their um, uh, regional director of Asia, he's teaching uh, a course in uh, peace and uh, conflict right away from uh, the UK and such a blessing for us to have Indian friends because they can be bilingual. For them, this is Hindi and how we can understand is Urdu. So that language barrier is not there as well. So that link is very, very significant as uh, for us and precious for us as well. Theological education in Pakistan, that's what I can say, is holding such a hope in itself. Yeah, that's what I can say that as Dr. Israel was saying, liberating theology. That's what we believe that, yes, theology is the whole, only hope for Pakistan. This injustice, that terrorism and all these things, we can see good leaders, good uh, leadership with such hope and Christ-minded people can bring that positive change in Pakistan. And that's what we are doing. And we seek your um, prayers and uh, guidance as well. Um. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lubna, for you know um, concluding with that wonderful note of hope. Uh, you know that is uh, really powerful. But also, you know, um, in spite of the many challenges, uh, you know, you talked about uh, you know uh, some of those um, uh, opportunities that are coming. Particularly, I mean, um, I'm sure David Marshall is here, and uh, you know there are others, you know, who um, try to encourage Christian students to study other religions. You know what you said. You know, um, a Christian. Uh, in uh, Pakistan uh, is off Muslim because you know that's uh, part of the training. You know that's uh, yes. that's very uh, interesting and very very powerful to hear. The other thing is obviously about the in spite of all the challenges, uh, uh, the development in uh, the role of um, or the involvement of women in theological education, <laughs> and that's really uh, heartening to hear. And and thank you for you know um, those um, stories. Uh, so thank you very much and. Um, yeah, so next, again, um, maybe five minutes, um, um, any initial questions or clarifications, maybe we'll take from two people um, at this moment, and then we can come back um, later. So any initial um, clarifications or questions or very short comments at this stage from anyone? Um, Yes, uh, Carol Tomlin. Okay. Hello, um, it's a delight to be here. Thank you for the wonderful presentation so far. Um, sorry, my voice is going, believe it or not, I've got a cold. Um, I found your um, presentation really interesting, um, Professor Lubna, um, especially in terms of the whole women's issues um, and did you say that there was now a female president or principal that is in your institution? Did you did you say that? Oh yes, and I am the one. Oh, you're the one. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, congratulations. Okay, um, because I'm too a principal of an online independent um, institution. Awesome. So, 
yeah so um i'd obviously like to perhaps make some connections with you um we can probably do that later but um yeah. just on that particular issue given the um as you said that most of the students or all of the students have a muslim background as well so in terms of the women how do they configure their own perhaps background in terms of christianity in terms of the issues of women in ministry how do they make sense of that I, I don't know if i'm making sense but how do they configure that particular issue given their muslim background and the whole issue of women in ministry which is an unresolved one in christianity uh yes uh, thank you so much carol for uh, your uh, question yeah. uh, first of uh, first thing i want to clear that the thing i shared is this that uh, we have hindu background actually most of uh, christians but uh, from our childhood, according to the Constitution of Pakistan, every student needs to read Quran. Myself, I memorized almost half, half of the Quran. So from our childhood up to graduation, we have to study as a mandatory subject of uh, kind of um, Quran. So we have a sound uh, background and study of that uh, Islamic theological education. And we need to observe all of their holidays, their rituals. So that's on that basis, I said that our uh, leader said that a Pakistani Christian is half Muslim because uh, we, we really go through all the practices and we know the basic education as well. So converting in Pakistan is such an issue. Yeah, we do have convert people, but not really from uh, Islamic background. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll so go back to that, and particularly with the you know question about women, you know, yeah. um, um, who, who have faced both the you know the challenge of Islam as well as the patriarchy within within you know Christianity. So you know we'll we'll come back to it. Thank okay. thank you, Lubna. Thank you. And um, um, yeah, uh, KK Kurvilla, um, please I request you to make uh, the comment very short. Thank you. No, no it's uh, nothing more. It's a great, uh, excellent presentation. It's very. Uh, it's very good presentation. It's very happy to hear about uh, the Pakistani church and its challenges. Thank you, Mudraj. Okay, thank you. Thank you, KK, for that comment. And uh, I mean, the last question at this stage uh, from Father um, uh, Falak Star, uh, Shea, sorry, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is um, uh, Father Falak. I'm working in Manchester. We got a very strong link between uh, Manchester and Lahore. And congratulations to Professor Lubna and um, your three ancestors been here visiting us in the diocese. Uh, uh, Dr. Purvez Sultan and Bishop Manor Rumal Shah, who've been acting as a principal before you, I think. So we've been supporting the uh, St. Thomas uh, Seminary a lot. And it will be very nice to link up with you, and uh, you are welcome to visit us in Manchester. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. And this Thank is you. a very, very brave thing for Pakistani church because it's not easy for a woman to be appointed as a principal of a theological college. So that's a very, very brave step in Pakistan. Thank you, thank you very much. That's very, uh, very powerful comment, and thank you very much. Uh, for, uh, so, shall we begin uh, our, um, you know, second part of the session? And um, um, those who have not done, uh, those who join later, you know, you're very, um, you know, welcome to um, put your name um, and your uh, institution and your country in the chat box, uh, you know, as a way of introducing uh, yourselves. That will be uh, really great. Um, so. Now we move to the third presentation um, uh, by uh, Reverend Rasika Abe Singhe uh, from uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, he's um, uh, Reverend uh, Rasika Abe Singhe is a lecturer in the Theological College of Langa, the only residential ecumenical uh, seminary in the whole of Sri Lanka. Uh, he's a minister in the Diocese of um, uh, Kuru Nagala, uh, Church of Ceylon. 
and he has widely published in various fields related to theology, uh, religious studies, and psychology, and, and he has actually, you know, in, the, in several related disciplines. And um, so we are very happy to have you, um, Father Rasika, with us uh, uh, this um, um, morning. And thank you very much uh, uh, for being with us. And the next 15 minutes uh, is yours. Thank you, Karen Spencer. And thank you, Dr. Muturaj. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in this uh, very important discussion. And I uh, bring you our best greetings from the Church of Ceylon and both the bishops, Bishop Kirti Fernando and Dushant Rodrigo, who are very strong supporters of theological education. And thank you also for TEAC for giving this opportunity and platform to hear and listen and share uh, very important aspects relating to this very important issue of theological education in South, uh, in Asia. Let me start with a very brief note on the Anglican Church in Sri Lanka. So the Anglican Church in Sri Lanka is called Church of Ceylon. That is the name of the country before independence. So we still retain it. And uh, two dioceses, I represent the Kurunagal Diocese, the, the kind of a new diocese that uh, composes the ancient kingdoms of the country and the middle part of the country. Also the kind of agricultural and plantation sector and the cultural regions of the island. The Diocese of Colombo uh, was established in 1845, a long time back, and that covers primarily every other region in the country, and it was the bigger diocese. So the Anglican presence was there in our country from 1796 uh, with the arrival of the British who took administration from the Dutch. And uh, the Anglican presence is very impactful and uh, uh, it's a kind of a proud legacy. The Anglican church has been very much present in aspects like nation building, peace and justice, social development. It has had a very strong presence in education child welfare, and also in communication and arts. Now I will turn to the challenges that we face for theological education in our country. So I have kind of demarcated three main areas. So the first one is the nature of theological education. One of the biggest problems we face is still, we are unable to bring theological education to everybody. Uh, first Bishop James Chapman, even in 18, 1845, he wanted this to happen, but unfortunately theological education is still seen as something that happens very far away and that is confined only to clergy. So this gives a few more challenges because obviously there is not much discussion on theological education and very less laity are involved. It gives into another further challenge because it is very difficult to promote theological education because most of the church is unaware of what happens in theological education, why we do it and how we uh, do it. The second challenge I titled as the scope of theological education. I think we share with our earlier speakers, sometimes there is a dearth of scholars in our respective fields. Even in our theological seminary, we have biblical studies and theological studies always in the hands of Roman Catholic ministers or in the hands of foreign scholars who may visit us from time to time. From the independence of our country nearly 70 years back, I could count less than seven persons who have 
kind of completed their doctorates. And they also could not kind of continue to be in education because sometimes your horizon gets broadened. And at our theological college, it is almost like a posting we find when clergy are asked to go to this college, they may say spend four, five years at the maximum because it's a very intensive course and lecturers also journey with the students. Sometimes they may get fatigue and frustration as well. So we do not have a very set system where prospective and kind of younger ministers can become prospective scholars and lecturers of the uh, college. The third challenge I titled as the content of theological education. We have had a very long and illustrious part past with the Senate of Serampo in India who have very graciously carried us for so many years. Uh, with the Bachelor of Theology Education degree. Uh, but unfortunately, we, we do have a problem where that is not recognized by our other universities. So most of our ministers who complete have to kind of stop their studies. We share with our sister in Pakistan. We do not have any postgraduate opportunities in Sri Lanka itself. So most of the time they may venture into other disciplines or they may kind of stop their studies by itself. The very talented and potential field candidates, they are unable to uh, find higher education opportunities. The church is also very defensive sometimes. They may not encourage them to find education opportunities on their own. And uh, we also do not have many links Recently, we must mention uh, uh, Theological Education College in Birmingham, Queen's Foundation, uh, most graciously helped us uh, in finding a link with the Theological Education where some of our students are now able to go there for higher studies. However, it is at its inception, so still no alumni, but we are very thankful uh, for this link. Also, we have a kind of a issue with language because most students who do come in are not very proficient in the English language. Even though we title our college as an indigenous college where we study in Sinhala and Tamil, uh, there are not much resources in those languages. So sometimes even from the beginning, students may have difficulty in accessing material, in reading material, and then finally even to go forward in these disciplines. So now I will come to the opportunities for theological education. And I guess the first opportunity is that, you know, this is being discussed at different levels in our church. And as I mentioned, both of our bishops are very, very interested in developing theological education with their many challenges. So obviously setting right these things will be a great opportunity for theological education development in Sri Lanka. But let me kind of think of it, this uh, kind of uh, topic in a kind of a philosophical manner and give you some idea about what Sri Lankan theology can actually offer and what a lot we can do from our context. We share with both of our sister and brother countries, uh, the multicultural context. In Sri Lanka also, we are a very multicultural context, but here the majority culture and faith is Buddhism. It is actually, not a religion, it is more like a philosophy and it is in a way atheist or maybe agnostic, how we may see it. But the church has kind of survived and has continued its dialogue with Buddhism 
and it has impacted the, our faith in so many ways. Our liturgies and the way we do our mission, our ministries, everything is totally transformed. So in a way, we have a very enriched theological education with this clash, in a way, with Buddhism. At our theological college of Lanka, we have more Buddhist books than there are theological books. And our most senior or the oldest lecturer is not a Christian minister, but a Buddhist monk. And there are more students who have studied Buddhism than who have been able to go for higher studies in Christianity. And even from the village level up to even discussions at theological levels, Buddhism has influenced us. So Sri Lanka and the Anglican Church has much to contribute to theological education in this manner. The second one, which we heard earlier as well, the liberation theology. Uh, Sri Lanka is now post-independence, now struggling with neo-colonialism as we see it. Sri Lanka is also post-war, surviving a very bloody conflict for 30 years. Sri Lanka is also titled a socialist country with a major pro proportion of our population in agriculture and fishermen communities and farmers and plantation sectors and much suffering, much alienation, much difficulty is uh, expressed and endured in these communities where the church survives. There are many of our ministers who have on their own uh, brought many ideas, enriching ideas of liberation theology uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective. So that is also another opportunity I see where we ourselves could study this more, but also we can share widely enriching the entire theological academia on this subject. We have also have a kind of field education program uh, in our theological college where we send our students for all four years of their training to identify with these communities and to challenge themselves in ministry. The third and the final opportunity I find is Asian emotionalism and the risk-taking of the Sri Lankan Anglican Church. While we may not have contributed in many ways, one area we have contributed is our liturgies. And if I can share with you our liturgies, they are very much indigenized, very much contextualized, uh, very much inculturated uh, with the common terms, with common chants and songs and gestures, postures and vestures. And we have been so radical that there are liturgies that are coming up called the Christian Workers Fellowship on the 1st of May, being true to our socialist nature. There is a mass, workers mass, where they would dress in red and bring the tools of labor and where we dedicate that service to people who work. We also have liturgies where we dialogue with Buddhism and Marxism in the same liturgy and other interfaith dialogue in the liturgy itself. Uh, there are many, many other liturgies. Sometimes, you know, people who may not be so conversant in liturgical studies may even be a little bit surprised how much our liturgies are contextualized. So this potential is certainly there. We have a very uh, motivated and talented group of uh, younger ministers who are coming to the ranks, even though it is very challenging for youth now to become members of the church, I guess it is happening everywhere. And there is also a kind of a very dedicated push from our church leadership 
to kind of think of theological education as something that is very important to everyone, not to be confined only to ministers, but to make everybody aware of the importance of it and to kind of continue dialogue with what happens in praxis, bring it to the classroom and then you also study and then you actionize it in the world. So I hope I was able to cover uh, three opportunities and three challenges and uh, thank you everyone for listening and I hope we will discuss some more in the next few minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Father Asika, for this wonderful presentation. Very informative, reflective, and bringing, um, uh, you know, highlighting the, some of the challenges, but also the opportunities in terms of, um, um, you know, how theological education engages with, uh, you know, the, the uh, local systems, you know, particularly the multi-religiousness, but also what from what you shared is also in terms of liberation theology and you know post-colonialism and other things how um theological education uh, in sri lanka but not only that christianity in general uh, dialogues with uh, the other parts of asia and and the world i mean that has been again um, very very interesting so thank you very much and uh, yeah we got um four minutes uh, for um initial conversations uh, any any initial questions so we have one from um okay we'll we'll um yeah we'll come to that stephanie about the inauthentic sources um yeah so for for any initial questions for uh, father rasika If not, I mean, um, I can share this question from Stephen. So this, of course, for not only for you, but for all uh, speakers, you know, how to um, counter inauthentic resources on the internet, which students uh, find and use. Uh, no, that is actually one question, um, you know, you may want to um, respond now or, or we can, you know, uh, take later. So how to counter inauthentic uh, resources on the internet which uh, you know many theological students sometimes use particularly given the uh, current context so that's one question um can i uh, yeah share some thoughts doctor yeah yeah uh, so doctor yeah now actually this came up as a big crisis in our college recently because we had this open book examinations mm. i think most of our principals and lecturers would be aware of this, you know, because we went to this new system. And then, you know, this gave our students an opportunity to, you know, have so many books <laughs> on your table here, have your phone, have your laptop and everything there and write. So unfortunately, we found that, you know, I mean, there is a plethora of information available, whatever you type, and, you know, sometimes, uh, they are really not what we can warrant or from a theological academia point of view, you know, where, uh, where we may kind of accept as acceptable material. So from the point of our students, of course, you know, they may cite, okay, we do not have this literature, these books, or it's not in our languages. So sometimes internet is very easy other than asking a lecturer. So quickly you can just type something and you can receive something that, that is totally uh, not related maybe even, and uh, the author is not from any academic yeah, or you know with any background. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, we really had that issue and uh, sometimes we were supposed to reference and that also was missing. So sometimes it was very difficult to understand uh, what, was the root of this? Where did this thought come from? Uh, but I think it's a real issue we find in one way. Uh, our technology is helping us, but on the other way, there is no filter. Thank you. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe it's a time, um, you know, we will move to um, avoid a conversation involving um, all the speakers. So thank you once again uh, for the Rasika um, uh, for your presentation, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you know, we are going to have uh, the conversation together for next uh, 30 minutes. Uh, maybe what I'll do um, in terms of, you know, some comments posted, um, I will, um, I'll quickly go through and, um, uh, you know, read one or two. Uh, if, um, you know, you all are maybe the respective, uh, you know, person can, um, you know, respond to that. So the one um, came um, to Dr. Israel David when he was uh, doing the presentation uh, from, um, I mean, I read Mtata to everyone. So liberation from far and to what again? Um, so I think there was some interruption. So I miss some words. I'm from Africa and what you say resonates quite well. So how do we translate these ideas uh, to the grassroots as they uh, seem uh, stuck in theological institutions? So the whole idea of liberation or liberation theology in theological institutions and 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 in the um, um, you know in, in the grassroots communities, how how that uh, you know translate? So that was actually um, one question, and then there was um, um, also I mean there was a question from Stephen about you know when Lubna you were uh, talking about the increase in number of uh, the women students. Uh, I mean, could you say something more about that? Because again, there was some, you know, interruption um, and, and we missed something. So if you could also, you know, if you could say um, something about that, uh, it will be, um, uh, you know, really good. And also another comment uh, to what you said, Lubna uh, from Miriam. Um, so question for Dr. Uh, Lubna. Um, does the fact that you all have such a good knowledge of Islam allow for opportunities for interreligious dialogue and cooperation uh, for some of the justice and peace issues in your society, communities at local level. Um, and, and so she says it's a great presentation. And the question is, um, um, you know, how um, this, um, you know, ability to, uh, the, the, uh, the possibility to learn a lot of Islam, how that helps, uh, you know, both in the theological colleges as well as in the uh, local churches to relate with um, uh, other, um, you know, um, other communities. And then um, um, another question from um, Wesley um, about contextualization, you know, how um, contextualization, I mean, it is again addressed to all, all speakers, uh, how contextualization uh, uh, has been, you know, translated into local churches rather than only in, in uh, theological institutions. And the question about the um, inauthentic online resources, again, you know, uh, remain for the others to respond. So there are a few of these questions and um, you know, I invite um, maybe starting with um, um, uh, Dr. Israel David uh, to give, um, maybe, you know, pick up what you, what you want to respond to. And, and so it is up to you, then Lubna, then uh, Father Rasika. Uh, thank you very much and thanks for that comments and the questions. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, repeat. Uh, it is liberation from those forces that attempt to block the freedom of becoming. I think someone has missed that uh, because I was, I know I was a bit fast. It is liberation from uh, those forces that attempt to block the freedom of becoming a better human. So it is better uh, in our classrooms and in our theological conversations to identify that so forces uh, to respond to that. And the second one is liberation to abandoned life and liberation for life in the spirit. So uh, I my understanding is which is both personal and societal. Uh, how to, my, I'm more in, uh, interested about the question, how to translate uh, these concepts uh, to grass uh, roots level. Uh, maybe I do not have uh, maybe a ready-made answer, but there are three things uh, come to my mind. Number one, uh, more or equal emphasis on praxis in theological education. Uh, number two, uh, bridging the gap between the co content and context, or rather, I would say the text. Uh, so there should be a lot of uh, efforts 
bridge the gap between the content and the text or uh, the 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 context uh, text and context and uh, third one what i'm going to say maybe i do not know whether everyone uh, will agree with those who are from india uh, most of our uh, theological curriculum and the syllabus are prepared by uh, the scholars the scholars the theological educators i think uh, we have left out the lay people's view the lay person's view the congregation's view the community's view uh, somewhere we have to involve uh, the uh, congregation and the faith community and the society in preparing our uh, uh, our uh, curriculum uh, our uh, syllabi uh, i think that is also one of the uh, important aspects that i believe which i have learned from this covid 19 uh, context uh, involving lay people so it should be a very collective effort to bring uh, a prepare a curriculum and uh, the second uh, maybe i will uh, stop here uh, about the inauthentic uh, uh, sources uh in fact it is a huge problem uh, as even i am involved in uh, guiding uh, the post graduate and phd students it's a huge problem at present and how to counter that uh, of course it is very difficult uh, i think we should think about uh, sharing the resources connecting the libraries with each other uh, and so that uh, uh it, all, most of the sources will be available to everyone uh and digitalizing the sources and sharing that uh, in our websites may may be helpful however as a supervisor i know as a research supervisor and guide it is a huge task for us to first of all to find out which is inauthentic and uh, another issue is plagiarism uh, i think that also has to be uh addressed uh, which has come up during our uh, uh, uh covid pandemic exam and also during uh, the research work uh, mm -hmm. i think we we need a collective effort uh, for to to counter this uh, one possibility is sharing the resources connecting the libraries and digitalizing and sharing that in our websites yeah um, yeah thank you uh, thank you uh, dr israel no that's very helpful you know, particularly you know ending with that focus on um, you know the whole question about examination and and yeah there's a lot to reflect on and and think about so thank you thank you very much and um, um and uh, i'm sorry a final comment maybe just a sentence i think uh, we should have our you know if if i since i'm from india i think we should develop our own way of thinking theological thinking and theological uh, uh, assessment uh, some sometime we are over in, you know influenced by i would not call western but i would rather say maybe the other patterns that we have which um, may not be adequate for us so we need to think more uh, from indian perspective thank you okay thank you thank you thank you very much um, um, dr israel and um, Lubna, you want to say something? Picking up um, any of those, um, any of the questions that you want to pick up? Yes, women in theology and the progress. I think one of the question uh, it was asked. So yes, um, a good change is come and is coming. So before eight years, if someone asked that, um, and you know, like people, uh, some of uh, people they. picked our student from the class and said uh, okay you are female what you are going to do after your uh, study so now in uh, presence of other female teacher so one of uh, one person from leadership he said to uh, one of my students what are you going to do after your graduation and i said she can be a teacher she cannot be pastor but we can <laughs> make pastors so this can be a good contribution as well and what i can see a bright side for female in pakistan that theological education is this that in pakistan um uh, some areas are very restricted for men to approach in many ways but it's open for female 
So when we will have theological trained uh, women, so they can go with mission mind uh, and can move easily in Pakistan. So this is kind of a really good side of uh, female in theology. And secondly, like we are not really competing for higher kind of positions in uh, churches. So we are really committed to teach and to learn as well. So women in uh, theology in Pakistan, they can be a really, really integral role and they are actually uh, started and uh, they are really contributing good now. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Lubna and Father Rasika. Yes, so uh, shall I answer the contextualization uh, issue? I already see uh, uh, yeah, uh, response previously and yeah. I, yeah. So I, I think it's, a, I mean, it's a general comment because I mean, obviously at our theological college, we encourage our students to think uh, radically. I mean, that's the real word. Uh, they have their kind of uh, sermon class at the end of their stay there. So they have to pass two sermon classes. So where you know they do some creative worship. So we certainly encourage them to do that. And also as lecturers, we invite our lecturers also to be kind of non-traditional in their approach to liturgy and the way they worship, because we think of our college as a lab kind of, you know, where you experiment many things. Of course, most of the things we do there may not be very receptive to uh, the congregation members. But I guess we, we had this Anglo-Saxon captivity uh, called by uh, a title given by one of our liturgists because, you know, in some of our churches, even now, even when uh, kind of a, a person from England, if, if he or she visits the church, they may not find anything different, different than how they worship uh, back there and here because sometimes we follow the same traditional liturgies and you know the hymns and everything. So I guess the role of theological education is twofold. One is to motivate our ministers to contextualize liturgies and to educate uh, people as well because we always worship in some sort of context. We, we don't worship without a context and uh, we through our context we are called to think of God and our relationship and spirituality differently than we, if we were worshipping maybe in a western context. So, uh, so I would say it's uh, radical but uh, let our young ministers, I'm always using young, they are not always young also, but let our ministers um, take up the challenge and challenge the people themselves to um, think good of these liturgical divisions that come. Uh, and most of the liturgies have to be passed by the, actually all liturgies have to be passed by our Episcopal Synod, where it may face revisions and things like that. So. There, there are not very radical elements as well in the liturgies we sanction for uh, general use. Uh, so there are no theological surprises or things like that. Uh, but even if there is, I, I, I guess we should all encourage our uh, students uh, to think this as a good thing. And also then not just to put it out there because you are motivated, but to educate educate our congregations uh, to think in their own language to uh, use general idioms and you know things like that in their worship uh, and to kind of really um, present our situation as a worship because you are coming to church with your own difficulty situations knowing the situation of the country uh, and the world and your own individuality as a Sri Lankan, which of ethnicity or background you may be part of. Uh, so let us use liturgies to show this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the Rasika. And um, maybe we'll take um, another round of questions. So there is one uh, question particularly to Lubna from 
737096. Um, I mean, if it is if it is possible, could you please um, switch on your video and ask that question? Is that possible about the theological education in Pakistan and uh, and the learning of Quran? I posed a question to uh, 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 Lugna asking now, is mandatory, uh, I mean, the learning of Quran uh, from uh, the number of years, it's a mandatory thing for them. So how do the theological education in Pakistan look upon that uh, from a positive point of view in order to bring uh, Islam and Christianity or studying another religion in a more positive way? Is it a blessing or is it a curse for them yeah. to produce scholars on that area of study? Yeah, thank you very much. And could you say your name and from where you join? I am Shelton from Sri Lanka. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Shelton, yeah, uh, that's what I can say. This is a blessing for us because uh, in our seminary, we don't, uh, don't need to teach Islam from the scratch because students, they already know about it. So we can move ahead and, uh, and it is uh, really helpful for us to make our study like according to context as well, because each and every student and plus our teachers, they have a strong background of uh, Islamic uh, theology or that understanding. So this is very, very helpful for us to teach in the seminary. That's what I can say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lubna. And uh, maybe two more uh, questions I, I think addressed to all the speakers, not specifically uh, to anyone, I think, but Maybe I'll, I'll, if it is okay, I'll invite um, uh, those people to speak in their own voice. So Prasad Phillips and then Stephen Spencer. Is Prasad. Um, Okay, so Prasad, can you ask that question? Can you unmute and ask that question? Or maybe we'll wait if there is a problem. Uh, Stephen, would you like to uh, then speak about the question of young people and theological education? Uh, yes, uh, yes, it's um, uh, one of the speakers earlier mentioned about the absence of young people and um, I'm very, very interested in the question of how how uh, their perspective perspectives uh, can help to influence the way in which theological education is done for for everyone. Um, how do we change our mindset so that we're more open to the way in which young people are communicating and seeing the world today? Uh, Obviously, I could try and answer that from a UK perspective, but but I'm very interested in how you would answer that from uh, Pakistan, Indian, or Sri Lankan perspective. And if any of any participants in the webinar have a, a, a strong view on this, we'd love to hear from you as well, uh, as well as the speakers. So we have a, a conversation. Yeah, I would like to talk about it because currently I'm going through from this uh, situation. We have recently appointed two young gentlemen for teaching and I'm facing such a critique about it that uh, how they will handle these issues in theology and all this stuff. So it is a really great challenge for myself even that uh, she's young and she's female or how she can be a president. So certain questions yeah, we are facing currently. Uh, the thing I uh, want to say that how we can adjust this problem and how we can welcome more people that some people when they ask question about me, so they couldn't uh, uh, kind of question my qualifications because my qualification, like my study background is very strong. Uh, currently I'm enrolled in a PhD program and I have different writings background as well. So that's why they couldn't really target it me. But uh, my new teachers, uh, my new colleagues, they are under target. So yeah, if we promote young generation with good scholarship and with good opportunity, so I think there will be a more solid ground for them that um, mature leadership, or I can say that older leadership uh, have a more kind of heart and uh, um, 
basis to accept this uh, young leadership. So they need more kind of opportunities uh, from Pakistan, what I can say, and I believe that from other countries as well, that if they go to on higher level studies and this kind of seminars and opportunities, if young one will get, so yeah, uh, people will accept uh, starting acceptance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lubna. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, thanks for that very significant question about perspectives which uh, I think that is one of the uh, important areas that we have to definitely concentrate. Mm. Uh, uh, I feel actually teaching some youngsters in my own uh, MTH, Master of Theology classes, uh, listening to their questions and their concepts, their perspectives. For example, I understand, my understanding of crisis, the way that I learned maybe 20 years back during my MTK studies and the very huge understanding of human crisis for my students are, I mean, it, it, is, it is quite different. I think uh, we have to be very open uh, to their uh, perspectives and uh, uh, to their uh, uh, concepts of crisis. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have a set pattern of uh, 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 definition of crisis, which we have learned uh, from a particular uh, 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 tradition, and that maybe it's, there were uh, th there is a kind of disconnection between what I say and the crisis my students and my, the community, their community go through in the uh, in their own context. I think we need definitely we have to redefine uh, uh, the the very nature of human crisis of human and based on that they they have different kinds of questions about god uh, you know on god uh, who is god to them and uh, the questions they raise where is god in this whole uh, uh, human crisis uh, i think the same question maybe i might have raised to my uh, professors 20 years back where is god but now my students, when they raise that same question, where is God, they mean something else. Uh, you know, God for them uh, is something else. So I think uh, we have to take uh, their opinion. And uh, I would rather say some of the, in, in, from Indian perspective, some of the uh, research works uh, in BD level, Bachelor of Divinity and Master of Theology have excellent answers to some of the questions that we have for human crisis. Uh, uh, I think that should be published uh, and that should be brought. And uh, you know, I, I come from United Theological College, Bangalore. There are good uh, theses, unpublished theses just in the library. And uh, uh, the accessibility is only to our students, those who are having physical accessibility. They have their own perspectives and they have their own uh, ways of understanding a particular issue, concern, and the way they bring the, their faith, their expression of their faith is something different. I think uh, that has to be brought out. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll continue to be disconnected <laughs> what we teach and what we read and what is the need of need in the context. Uh, for example, let me say this and conclude. Even about the models that we, fo we follow pa in pastoral counseling, you know, I teach pastoral counseling and pastoral psychology. Uh, I think there is a lot of need to develop new contextualized uh, 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 pastoral counseling models, uh, which our uh, young people are bringing uh, through their research. I think that has to be somewhere, it has to be brought out uh, to, the, uh, to the church. Um, they have beautiful paradigms. They have good responses to human crisis. I think that has to be brought out. Uh, yeah, uh, especially during uh, COVID pandemic, the mental health issues. Uh, you know, the young people, those who have gone through uh, the mental health, the stress. Uh, I think some have somehow somewhere the theological education has, let me say, very maybe very. Uh, roughly, <laughs> we have failed. We have failed uh, to respond. You are not prepared uh, to respond to the stress uh, that has been uh, 
uh, exposed by uh, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic? These are the questions that the young people are having. Uh, I think we have to be very open uh, uh, to them. We need a listening ear. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Israel. And uh, yeah, Father Rasiga, do you want to say um, anything? Ah, yes, uh, Doctor, very briefly, I can uh, thank you, Karen Spencer, for that uh, very important, I think, uh, topic. Because, you know, when I was a student, just about 10 years back, I think, we had 90% of our student uh, population who were bachelors. And now we have more than 75% who are married students. So that means the age of coming to theological education is uh, mature, very much mature. So I think this dialogue is very necessary. But on the other side, I am not part of any kind of theological management. But I think I guess the issue for the church is church and the congregations expect a kind of a, you know, kind of a super man or woman at the end of these four years. You know, they should be able to do pastoral and studies and administration and do everything. They are investing also for that. So this kind of four years or five years, sometime do we have that flexibility to be that creative maybe to design a different way? So I, I guess that is my question. While I, I understand that a lecturer maybe could have done a lecture directly 20 years back, Maybe students will not listen to something like that for so many years. Now, now, uh, I guess we need to rethink it. But I'm also thinking the time frame and our capacities and the expectations, I guess, at the end. Uh, so for the sake of getting more young people, we have to do revolutionize everything. But I guess, uh, will that go down well with our church leaders and the congregations who support, but it's up to you. I, I, I am I am actually going to listen now to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Father Asiga. And maybe we'll have the last uh, question from uh, Father Falag, Asher. You want to say something? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Lubna has only uh, highlighted the life of Church of Pakistan. Uh, but there is 75% uh, uh, Catholics in Pakistan. And uh, we've got a very good institute. One of the institute is in Karachi, Christ the King Seminary. I'm born and brought up Catholic. I'm a trained Catholic priest in, from Pakistan. And uh, we did for two years philosophy, four, uh, four year theology uh, in the major seminary and all these subjects, we Islam and uh, moral theology and inculturation. And Catholic Church is very, very strong and broad uh, in Pakistan with the inculturation. We've got a center Maktabai Anavim in Sadoki in Punjab. And there we just uh, work from the grassroots level where the theology is uh, merging from the ground level. And all these things are happening. And the young priests, the young Catholic priests are very much uh, influenced uh, and mingling with the cultural value and the spiritual values. I do not have uh, much inside of Church of Pakistan except the Diocese of Lahore. So I don't know the inside, uh, what sort of subjects uh, uh, St. Thomas uh, Seminary is uh, doing. And it's only, I think, two or three years course uh, in uh, St. Thomas. And I also heard that there are not many uh, churches, the dioceses are sending uh, financial help and their students as well to St. Thomas uh, Seminary. But for you, Lubna, it's a great resource. Christ the King Seminary, which is a national theological uh, seminary, they do accept lay people for training and all sorts of things. And they... Uh, they uh, give the certificate and degrees as well. So I think if you could link up with them, uh, you will be more in a, a good position uh, to have a more insight of the theological and cultural thing. And I think uh, the Catholic Church in Pakistan is growing a lot uh, from the grassroot level to, uh, to the high level, uh, I think. So that's my just input putting you in a background in uh, Pakistani church, in uh, Catholic church in Pakistan. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Father uh, Falak. I'm taking into, you know, Father Falak's comments. So I invite, um, um, I mean, all three speakers, uh, starting with uh, Lubna and Father Rasiga and uh, um, Professor Israel to say um, your final um, response very briefly. Yeah, thank you so much, such a uh, wonderful, blessed pleasure. It really encouraged me. And you know, the chat I received, that was direct. And uh, actually this is uh, kind of my third month to be president. And this is the moment I can say that boosted up my energy and it blessed me really. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Father Asika. Uh, yes, Sivra, so thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the many ideas and uh, perspectives we heard. So generally, if I may say that, you know, South Asia is a reservoir of uh, talent and potential. So let us pray for uh, development of theology education and, you know, kind of linking with the rest of the world, with our friends and our partners. Uh, hopefully we, our the three countries we discussed and other Asian countries, they can be the next centers of excellence in theological education and you know we people will flock to see what we have to contribute maybe uh, in years to come thank you yeah thank you thank you for the rasiga and professor israel yeah i to join uh, my colleagues from pakistan and sri lanka in thanking uh, uh, dr stephen and dr mutraj for giving us this opportunity in fact it is a privilege and uh, especially I thank uh, uh, Reverend uh, Ms. Lubna for uh, her presentation to hear from Pakistan's experiences. It is something a kind of eye opener to me personally. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think we need more conversation like this. And uh, I thank the organizers uh, for this excellent initiative. Uh, I think you have brought many people together to listen and to learn. And to unlearn, in fact. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so, let me conclude with a word of hope. I, uh, in my past 22 years, I, I have lived in uh, theological uh, college campuses in different colleges. Uh, theological education has uh, encountered a lot of challenges, but still it is alive. I think that's a hope. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, we will always overcome and uh, because theological education, I believe strongly, belongs to church, and it belongs, and it is a tool in the, for the mission of God. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Israel, and and all three of you. And yeah, so we are uh, we got you know last uh, two or three minutes, but uh, please allow me to say a few um, you know kind of threats very briefly. Uh, from you know what you all shared and to as, as a way of concluding yeah i mean obviously you know the pandemic has uh, you know um, helped us to um, uh, think about theological education differently so starting with the human crisis but also um, you know to understand and respond to that um, in a different way as as you know we began and then in all the three conversation uh, three presentations you know what we have come across is actually the the multi-religious context, you know, learning Hinduism, learning, you know, Muslim Islam, learning Buddhism and other, you know, uh, philosophies, how in, in theological education in South Asia, that is one of the uh, key features, uh, you know, without which we really can't do theological education. And also, I mean, the whole question about contextualization, you know, that goes along with that, you know, some of the comments, uh, you know, reflected that. And also another one, you all, you know, uh, return to that again and again, the whole question of, you know, how we take theological education beyond the seminaries, uh, you know, the institutions to the grassroots. And, and I, I sometimes I used to think that it is not only taking, but also learning from, you know, the grassroots, what is already going on um, and, and how actually that could be, I mean, uh, yeah, you, you all brought that, how that could be incorporated into uh, uh, theological education uh, systems. And then very specifically, we've been also um, you know, reflecting and we will continue to reflect about the questions of examination, how we examine students, which I personally think as I have struggled with that, those issues uh, with some of you know in India. And, and I'm, I'm quite keen that you know how this will really 
help us to take this you know, further to, and along with the whole question of in other resources and how we will help our students and help ourselves you know with with you know overcoming those problems and also the many opportunities in spite of the challenges the many opportunities particularly you know uh, listening to pakistan and you know, where you know we know we hear a lot about the political situation but not much about theological education and church you know in pakistan so it was very powerful and then particularly what he said uh, lubna about learning islam as well as about the women you know role as the you know first ever principal of the college so that's that's very 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 powerful and then finally, you know, obviously, as you all brought, and as you know, Dr. Isra also uh, ended with that that note of hope. And when when you know uh, you all shared with, uh, about that, you know, in, in spite of all the challenges, how we will continue to um, engage in theological education and excel, uh, not just the pandemic, even you know, theological education faces other challenges. And in thinking about hope, I was just thinking three words, you know, within that, you know, hope that is built on. Um, I mean, what you particular phrase that attracted uh, Dr. Israel from your uh, paper is actually uh, the one you use the caring patterns. Uh, you know that that actually you know suddenly theological institutions realize at this stage, but uh, you know it it really needs to become a part of uh, the 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 education. So care and compassion and also courage. You said that whatever happened, you know, we will actually continue to you know uh, grow in theological education. So hope that is built on care, compassion, and courage as you brought um, in all your uh, discussions. So these have been very helpful. And um, and thank you so much for your time and, and your uh, presentations and the conversation. So 